Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, let's get started here. The class today is an overview of separation processes. We're going to be introducing some terminology we'll use throughout the course. In, um, and I wanted to start by just giving you a very broad overview of the importance of separation systems. Uh, and you'll probably be surprised, or maybe it's obvious to you, how frequent separation systems occur in your everyday life. So that's what we're going to look at. We'll start off a bit with some economics and why separations are important from an economic principle, uh, from an economic point of view, I should say. We will look at, at a video of sugar production, something that we all use every day, but you probably don't realize how complex the production for that simple product is. And then we'll look at some of that terminology that I was referring to. And I'll also give you some feedback about the forms you filled in in the class on Friday. So think here for a second, give yourself a minute, uh, discuss with the person next to you, what are some of the ways that you could separate an impurity, a dissolved impurity, salt, or types of salts from water? There's two options, electrodialysis and electrodeionization, so using electrical current. But what are some of the other ways that you could think of to purify water? How else? Yeah, sure. Evaporate the water off, so putting in some heat into the system to drive off the water and separate that out. And then how do you recover the water? Uh, condense it somewhere. Condense it somewhere, okay. So another heat intensive step to, to remove the heat, okay. Any other suggestions? Yeah. Use a membrane, so it's a filter. And we're built, then separating based on the principle of Concentration gradients through there, size exclusion of the molecules. Yeah. Crystallization. Crystallization. So try to precipitate out the salts. Okay. So good, good three suggestions. Any other suggestions? Okay. And this, so this is a, there's a few more here that you can go look at. Uh, one option here is to add a solvent to preferentially take up water, and then leave the dissolved salt behind in the aqueous phase. Um, pressure and force it through a membrane. Ion exchange is another one, so adsorption. Um, many of you have used or seen at least these breeder water filters that you can buy in the grocery store, right? So there's adsorption, ion exchange taking place on that. Um, if I can, let's see if I can do this quick. Maybe I can give you a close up view of what this looks like. So there's the water filter. And inside it is really just this black stuff. It's charcoal, activated carbon. It's just coconut that they've taken and they've, they've toasted it. And it has a large, large surface area and then will adsorb, AD, absorb those impurities. So here's a bag of it. You can pass it around to take a look if you've never cut one of those filters up before. Um, so several ways to separate out salts from water. And you'll see this with any separation process in general. There's more than one way to achieve the, your goal. Some might be more energy intensive, less energy intensive. Some might require you to add something. So here, for example, we're adding a solvent to take up the water. So you've got to, there's some costs associated with that addition and mixing of that solvent. There's energy costs if you're trying to freeze to form ice crystals, the crystallization step. There's costs if you're using a membrane. That membrane is fairly expensive um, material that you have to use to separate. So there's, there's a variety of options from which you can consider. Let me just quickly talk a bit about this uh, slide. This is uh, some numbers from the textbook, from a standard separations textbook by King who says that 50 to 90% of all capital invested in a process goes to the separation steps in a petroleum flow sheet. That's a phenomenal amount, right? When you look at the cost of building a chemical plant in the, in the millions and billions of dollars sometimes, that more than half of that is going to separators and separating devices, not to reactors, not to piping, not to pumps, not to heat exchangers, but to separation units. Okay, so they're important for us in our flow sheet. From an ongoing operational point of view, so the operating costs, 
they can be as much as 60 to 100% of your costs are just due to the separation units. In your lifetime, there's probably going to be three separators, three separation principles that are going to be important to us. Carbon capture, not just pure carbon, but also methane and other carbon-based products. Air pollution, so dust, for example, and then clean water and sanitation. Okay, so there's, there's three important separation problems right there that you could easily make an entire career of. And what's nice about that is your career is going to scale with the number of people on the planet. So everyone needs to breathe, everyone needs to drink water. So as long as there's people on the planet, those separations are going to be important. How many people are on the planet right now? Seven something billion. Okay, so back here, when my grandmother was born, there were 1.5 million, billion people. When I was born in 1977, somewhere over there, there were about three and a half. When you were born in the mid in the 90s, we were up there. Okay, and in your career, it's, either, it's definitely going to peak and then maybe drop off, but it's, it's not going to go down. Okay, so these problems of air, clean air, clean water are always going to exist wherever you are, wherever you plan to work. Okay, so you always, if you choose to have a career in the area of separation processes, you, you're gonna, there's gonna be some demand. So it's an important concept from that point of view. Now, before I take a look at these everyday examples, I do want to also just introduce our second TA for this course. Kushlani was, a, was away and, and just came back. Kushlani, would you like to introduce yourself and also just talk about the separations work you're doing in your master's research? Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm currently working on my master's with Dr. Adams. I'm working on a semi-continuous process <coughs> intensification technique where I'm trying to separate four components using just one distillation column and two metal vessels. Because uh, in, a, in a typical continuous system, you would need three distillation columns. Um, so just some results that I found so far, I can get the capital cost down, but operating costs are low, um, so are higher, um, but that's what I'm working on right now. So. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Kushlani is in JHE 370. If you're looking for the T TA email address that we shared uh, at the, in Friday's class, uh, Kushlani will also be checking that TA address so you know where to get hold of her. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, let's go look now at separations in our everyday life. Um, if you're, if you're making spaghetti at home, after you've boiled the water, you need to sieve it or screen it out is the technical term we'll use in this course, screening or sieving, to separate water from the spaghetti. If you're washing your hands or dishes, you're adding soap. You're adding an extra material to then separate that dirt. So you're dissolving that dirt away into the soap and into the water phase. And if you're maybe making some sort of oil where you're extracting the flavors from various spices or garlic or whatever you're adding to the oil, there's a liquid-liquid extraction taking place. Uh, you're, you're moving into the aqueous phase there. Can you think of any other separators around the house? So I'll put the technical term up there, but can you think of the separator in your home that corresponds to a cyclone or a filtrate, filtration step? Take a look at that list, maybe see if you can fill in the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. But what are you separating? Okay, suggestions for filtering. Coffee filter, a tea bag is also a kind of way of doing that. Uh, leaching. 
you have a leaching step in your home? When you're making tea, that's leaching. When you're making coffee, that's leaching. You're leaching out the coffee extract from the ground beans or into, into the water phase. Adsorption is that breeder water filter example. Right? Uh, anyone think of a cyclone? Anyone seen or used cyclone technology? A septic tank, yeah, not a cyclone, but it's certainly uh, separating out. It's almost like a de almost like a decanter into two phases. Yeah. A washing, a washing machine is which type of? Yeah. A Dyson vacuum is a, is a cyclone. Okay, so when you see one of these pink colored links in the notes, oh, it's disappeared. Okay, so I, it was pink. <laughs> it's not been anymore. I was modifying the notes this morning. There's, uh, I'll post on the course website at least then, a YouTube link that you can go see the Dyson vacuum and how they've exploited simple cyclone technology that actually comes from the engineering world and they've patented it and used it in vacuum cleaners and it does a really good job to separate dust from the air. Um, a clothes dryer is a phase change by heat addition. Um, a dehumidifier separates water out from the air by removing heat. And centrifugation, your, your washing machine is, is, is centrifuging out there at the last spin cycle to separate the water out. Right. So many separators around your house, each of you have a whole bunch of separators inside your body. Your kidneys, your lungs, your liver, your gallbladder, intestines, spleen, lymph nodes, and some others there. Okay? So you're carrying a variety of separators with you in your, in your body. No difference to a chemical process. Chemical processes, if you look at them by and large, as I showed in Friday's class, you've got your raw materials coming in. Very crudely, you've got your reaction step and then very crudely you've got your separation steps most chemical flow sheets if you look at them you can crudely break them up into those sorts of sections your human body very much the same okay. in fact one thing that's interesting about this course and reactor design is those are the only two courses you take as chemical engineers that are unique to chemical engineering. Every other course you take, other engineers can also do. You're not the only people that take numerical methods. You're not the only people that take heat transfer. You're not the only people that take fluid mechanics or materials. Every other engineers take a variety of the other courses we take. The only two that are unique to chemical engineering are reactor design and separation processes. Those are the two features that distinguish a chemical engineer from the other engineers uniquely. Okay, so that's a, another important reason why you're all in this class as well. Okay, so let me perhaps uh, show you this video next. It's a video that shows how sugar is produced. And this is a flow sheet <laughs> where the entire flow sheet is separations from beginning to end. So it's 100% separations and what I'd like you to do is pay attention as the video is progressing and look at the various unit operations that are there. And when each unit shows, decide what is being added to create the separation. Separations don't just happen for free, right? Separations, we need to add energy or we need to add some sort of material to create the separator, to create the separation. So whenever you see that unit being shown in the video, decide is energy being added or removed or is some material being added or removed to create the separation. Okay, let's see if I can get this going. Next time you reach for the sugar bowl, Try to imagine that it was once so rare and expensive, it was called white gold. Producing sugar from the sugar cane first took place in India. About 300 BC, Alexander the Great's army reported seeing a reed that gives honey without bees growing there.
This table sugar has many names. Mill white, plantation white, and crystal sugar. But it all comes from the sugar cane. It looks a lot like bamboo, with fully grown stalks that can measure up to six meters high. Here in the field, a worker pairs away the husk from a stalk of sugar cane, then chews the cane's raw pulp to extract the stalk's sweet juice. This machine harvests the cane by cutting it at the base. Rotating scrolls feed the cane to the chopper drums inside. As they chop the cane, a fan blows the lighter leaves and tops back onto the field. The heavier lengths of cane drop into the base of a conveyor, which feeds them into the transport bin that follows alongside. Trucks rapidly transport the cut cane to the sugar mill for processing. Once cut, sugar cane begins to lose its sugar content, and damage to the cane during harvesting accelerates this decay. At the mill, trucks empty their load onto a receiving table. It feeds a belt conveyor that takes the cane through two separate washes. The cane must be as clean as possible before extracting the juice. But first, the cane's hard structure is broken down inside this crusher, where rotating hammers break the cane into small pieces. A conveyor loads it into a milling tandem designed to extract the sweet juice from the crushed cane. In this milling tandem, the cane passes through a series of five or more consecutive mills. Large cylinders compress the cane fiber. The juice pours out of the milling tandem and diverts into a channel away from the bagasse the dry pulp that remains after extracting the juice. A worker supervises the operation at each of the mills. A vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice is extracted from the sugar cane, it's time to process it. However, before turning the juice into sugar crystals, a sample goes through a series of tests at the sugar mill's laboratory. First, a technician adds a thickener that binds to impurities in the juice, and then filters it to obtain a clear, clean juice. Then, he pours it into a polarimeter, a machine that measures the concentration of sugar. The juice from the mills now falls through this 10 meter high tower as sulfur dioxide vapors rise through it. This process, known as sulfitation, bleaches the juice. Then the juice flows through a device that measures its pH level. While at a separate vat, workers add powdered lime to water, preparing a solution to which they will then add the juice. An agitator mixes the cane juice and lime solution for about six hours to complete a process called alkalization. It regulates the juice's pH level and helps clarify it. In reaction to the lime, the juice's color changes from brown to yellow. Next, the juice goes into these clarifier tanks. It takes over two hours for the juice to settle and for the impurities to fall to the bottom of the tank. A sample taken from the tank shows how the sludge collects at the bottom, while the clarified juice collects at the top. Next, we'll see how this clarified juice transforms into flowing crystals of white sugar. filter the residue, known as mud. There's no waste here. The mud will fertilize the cane fields, and the bagasse will be burned as fuel. The clarified juice collected from the clarifier tanks now boils in a series of evaporators. 
This brings the concentration of the sugar in the juice up from 15% to 60%. Then the juice collects in 15-ton tanks to clarify even more. Any sediment left in the juice floats to the top. A rotating paddle skims this residue off to the sides of the tank. These tanks produce a type of syrup that goes on for still more processing. Workers now pour microscopic sucrose crystals suspended in alcohol into the syrup. This milky solution binds to the sugar present in the syrup and helps draw it out. Next, it all boils in large vacuum pans, forming sugar crystals. As the water in the syrup boils away, workers regularly check to see how the sugar is crystallizing. The goal? To produce a thick crystallized paste known as masquit. It then goes into a high-speed centrifugal machine to remove the sugar crystals from the uncrystallized syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1200 revolutions per minute. This action draws the molasses to the outer shell of the machine, while the crystals remain in the inner basket. Sprays of water wash the crystals, then the water is drawn out so that only the crystals remain. This centrifuge works much the same way as a washing machine set on the spin cycle. It draws out moisture from the sugar, much like you draw out the wash water from a load of laundry. Next, a conveyor belt carries the sugar crystals out of the centrifuge. This mill produces raw sugar, which has a higher molasses color and is unbleached, and plantation white sugar, which has less molasses and is bleached a brilliant white. The sugar on the conveyor now goes into a large dryer. Hot air blows into this dryer to bring the sugar's humidity level down to 0.02%. That's standard for table sugar. The dried sugar pours out of the dryer into a bag on a scale. It's full when it weighs in at 1,000 kilos. A hoist then carries the bags to a platform at the far end of the packing facility. At 3,000 kilos, that's a heavy load. It lowers each bag over a chute that leads to the factory's main floor. Workers carefully open each bag in turn and pour out the sugar directly into the chute. It feeds an automated packaging machine which fills a series of two kilo plastic bags, seals them and separates them. This packing facility produces 200,000 bags a day. That means processing 400 tons of white sugar daily. This fine plantation white sugar is available in a variety of convenient packaging options, and that should sweeten anyone's day. So in the notes then that you have, you can see uh, this is the flow sheet from a, from a textbook. It's not from that particular process, but all those unit ops that were shown there in the video um, appear in some form in this flow sheet. So what I'm going to do is just leave it there for you to look at. There's two pages of it in the notes, part one and part two. And in the assignment coming up, you'll have some short questions just on identifying the mass agents and the energy agents that were added to those separation steps. But it's also really interesting for you to spend some time looking at it and just to see how these are sort of integrated with each other and 
the flows from one unit to the next. Um, pretty interesting how many steps are required to create something so basic. Okay, let's, uh, let's look back a bit at the forms that you filled in on Friday when you went through the whole alphabet of separators and you identified a variety of them. And then after that, I asked you to list some of the separation units that you'd be interested in seeing covered in this course. Um, so there they are, and the numbers there indicate the number of times that unit was mentioned. Now, we're definitely covering membranes, filtration, wastewater treatment. Uh, someone mentioned the interesting DECA process that's uh, worth Googling. Uh, it's a really interesting process there for water treatment. Centrifuges, cyclones, flocculation, crystallization, we won't uh, cover unless I have time. But pretty much anything that's got two and above, we definitely are covering. So it's interesting to see that what you wanted to cover and my plan uh, for covering them is, is overlaps. Distillation is the only place where it doesn't overlap. And what I wanted to do here is just get some feedback from you individually. I don't need, need you to tell me. I have a small handout here, and I'd like you to spend about five minutes um, filling it in. This is an individual piece of work. Um, it's no sense if you're copying someone next to you's answers. Don't feel that you need to get the right answer. In fact, your name it doesn't appear on this form, so I'll not know what you don't know and do know about distillation. This handout just gives me a sense to see how much you do know about distillation, how much you don't know about distillation, so that if I do cover it in this course, I'm covering topics that are worthwhile and not repeating stuff that you've seen in prior courses. So I'll give you uh, five, seven minutes to fill that out, um, and please do so individually. Okay, just keep it.
And so I'll give you another minute or so. And if you're done, uh, if you can pass them down towards this end of the class, please. <clears throat> So I got them all. <clears throat> There's a few here. Have I got everyone's over here? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, that, uh, that will help guide uh, my decision to look at potentially adding in distillation columns, though the course has some content we have to cover. Distillation columns isn't in the official course outline, but um, I'll take a look at that and, and make some decision about it. We, the way the course is structured is we build up in terms of complexity from fairly simple processes. So you saw there in the sugar video the sedimentation happening in that conical flask. The sugar was settling down to the bottom, leaving the clear liquid behind. That's a pure mechanical separation. We're relying on gravity to do the separation for us. We'll look at a variety of, of mechanical separation techniques. We'll then look at mass transfer. So liquid-liquid extraction is, is an example of mass transfer. Then we'll look at phase creation or addition. So you're adding heat to the system or you're adding a new phase to the system to cause the separation and then heat transfer. Distillation actually comes and combines a variety of these together. Um, we're adding heat and creating new phases and, and to separate. So it, if we add distillation to this course, it would naturally fall at the end. Um, just a topic here in terms of terminology, it may not be apparent to you, but when we refer to fluids, a fluid in this sort of course is either a liquid or a gas. So a fluid isn't necessarily a liquid phase. A gas is also considered a fluid for the purposes of separation system. So You'll often hear this topic in engineering, solid fluid separations. That's either liquid from solids or gas from solids. Um, could be either of those. In terms of where we will start, as I mentioned, we'll look at mechanical separations first. So sedimentation, thickeners, clarifiers, centrifuges, cyclones. And um, if we have a bit of time, we'll just talk a bit about magnetic separations and electrophoresis. Physical barrier separations, those are your filters, your membranes. And a membrane really is a sophisticated filter. Um, and then there's a variety of membrane separations. Micro, ultra, nanofiltration, reverse osmosis, they're all tied up in, in that topic over there. Then we'll look at this mass, base, uh, mass transfer based separations, so liquid-liquid extraction and supercritical fluid extraction, we'll, we'll maybe just mention. That's a way that uh, coffee is decaffeinated, for example, is using SCFE, supercritical fluid extraction. Solid fluid separations that are, take place in a column, so adsorption, ion exchange, chromatography. You've got this movement down the column or 
left to right or right to left, depending on the column's uh, orientation. And then uh, you get mass transfer occurring in that, in that column. And then finally, heat transfer based separations, such as evaporation, drying, distillation, crystallization, they all land up in that, in that area. So we'll actually build up our complexity from fairly simple mechanical forces, add mass bit transfer, add heat transfer to end of the course. Now, there was also a request for bioseparations, and a, a number of you in the class are in the bio stream. Chemical engineers make great bioengineers. Whether you're streaming into that area or not, the only difference is that when we look at bioseparations, the regular principles of separations we will consider in this course apply as well to bioseparations. The only difference is when you do a bioseparation, you're often doing it at biocompatible conditions, such as lower temperatures, lower pressures, and, and mid-range pHs. Right? So other separations would use high temperatures, high pressures, extreme pHs perhaps. With bioseparations, we simply use biocompatible conditions. But otherwise, the same principles apply. So centrifugation, precipitation, adsorption, filtration, membrane separations can all be applied equally well um, in the bioseparation area. So all these topics are equally applicable. When we look at all those units that I mentioned there earlier, we will look at them from several aspects. We'll pretty much cover a new unit every week, and in that week we will look at what principle causes that separation. How do you basically size the unit? And the reason why we'll only look at the basics is because the vast majority of you will not spend your career designing these units. And if you do, the techniques you use to design these units are far more complex than this course would ever be able to cover. So we will look at the basic principles that determine the size of a unit. How, what is a basic way to calculate the diameter or the length of the unit? Um, what, what aspects are the critical parameters that affect the unit's cost? Is it the diameter? Is it the rotational speed of the centrifuge that determines the unit's cost? Um, what is that, that costing aspect? And then importantly is how to troubleshoot it and how to optimize it. So Kushlani's master's research when she introduced it there was right on this topic, how to optimize it, how to use less energy, increase the separation efficiency, modify an existing unit to get greater separation at higher throughputs. Those are what you're likely going to be working on as an engineer. In the company you work at, there's already going to be a centrifuge. There's already going to be a distillation column. There's already going to be a separator. How can you do more with the same equipment? To install a new piece of equipment, to buy it, to install it, to integrate it into your flow sheet is tremendously expensive. And companies don't do that regularly. What they'd much rather do is take your existing unit and be able to do more with what you currently have. So that's those, um, those last two problems there. Optimizing it and, and fixing problems with it. So that will be our focus primarily. So here let me um, ask you to think about separators in a different perspective. There's several angles which we can look at separation processes. Here's another one for you to consider. And I'd like you to look at these six blocks over here and enter the name of a separator where the major component on the vertical axis is being separated from the minor component on the horizontal axis. So for example, in this particular block, you're separating a li predominantly liquid phase from a minor amount of solid. What type of separator would you use to separate lots of liquid from a small amount of solid? Okay, so think about it in that perspective. Fill in these six blocks over here with some names of unit operations that you can think of.
Okay, let's start up here maybe with, um, with that one I'd, I'd asked you to, to work with. How do you separate a lot of liquid from a small amount of solid? What might be a typical unit there? Yeah. A, filter. a filter. So minor amounts of solids being filtered from your liquid phase. That's like your coffee filter at home. There's less solids, more liquid. Any other examples in that particular block? Yeah. Leaching. Can you use a cyclone? Can you put liquid through a cyclone? Yep, you can. You can put cyclone centrifuges would be another example over there. But a cyclone more, more commonly is used for vapor phase separations, vapor from solids. So a lot of air being separated from dust, for example. So a minor amount of dust, solid, being separated from a lot of vapor phase, that's a cyclone, would, would work well in that block. Any other separators that would work there in that bottom corner? Sean? Some sort of membrane? Some sort of membrane with vapor phase. Okay, we'll look at membranes and see maybe that might work, but there'll be huge pressure drops there, right? Okay, but it's doable, yeah. An air scrubber, yeah. Air, any sort of air cleaning system is likely going to be in, in, that, in that block. So wet scrubbers, cyclones um, are typical examples. What is an example of solid from solid separation? Sorry? Magnetic. Magnetic separator. What about flotation? Is flotation, what is, what is happening in a flotation cell? Solid from solid separation, right? So we'll, we'll talk a bit about flotation perhaps later on. There's one other suggestion perhaps? No. You lost it, okay. Magnetic uh, separators, screening separators, screens. So you're using screens to separate one size of solid from another size of solid would work well in that column. In this uh, top right-hand corner, sorry, in this middle corner, a liquid phase, small amount of liquid being separated from a lot of solid. What sort of unit is that? Fracking. Solid from liquid. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, drying, if you're drying solids, like that's, that uh, sugar fl video right there at the end, you saw that sugar being tumbled over there. There's a, an example of that. Liquid from liquid. Distillation, everyone knows distillation, yeah. Liquid, liquid extraction, solvent extraction would be an example there. Ion exchange, so adsorption, you're absorbing one liquid preferentially onto the solid phase and allowing the other liquid that doesn't adsorb to pass through. So liquid from liquid separation. And then finally, a liquid phase from gas phase. So for example, think of liquid droplets being separated from air. Sorry? Cool the temperature, yeah. So any sort of thing that's condensing out small liquid phase particles from gas particles. A cyclone would work well over there as well, a scrubber. Okay, So we can always look at separators based on this, this matrix. The reason why I asked you to not look at the last column is that there's very few separators that, that work well in those. Um, but for example, uh, heating. Heating if you're trying to remove gas phase from solids, but that doesn't occur very often. Uh, gas phase from liquids. Um, also doesn't occur very often. And then adsorption is one that goes down there in the bottom right-hand corner. So if you're adsorbing a gas preferentially. Okay. So we'll, we'll think of separation sometimes from this perspective. And then what I'll do is I'll take up in next class this idea of ESAs and MSAs. And then we'll get started with the topic of sedimentation. Okay, so I'll see you in class next time.